Thanks for those questions. Uh, a couple of things before I introduce our next speaker. If you've enjoyed today's uh, presentations, don't forget that the Ephemera Society is 0501C3 and you're able to show your appreciation by making a donation if you go to our web page. Um, the other thing I want to give a plug to is our uh, in-person fair, 15th to 17th of March in Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, we were just reminded hotel bookings are due now. So if you want to get a discounted rate on the hotel, uh, always a fascinating. We always had much more speakers, uh, broader uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, that's not the right word, but um, fascinating nevertheless. Um, right, let's get on. Uh, Evie uh, Eisenberg is our next um, presenter. Um, Evie forwarded her CV, which is much more manageable. Let me read it to you. Uh, it's enjoyable. Evie Eisenberg is a retired math and English teacher who has been an ephemera dealer for over 30 years. She uses her considerable research skills as a crossword puzzle tester for the New York Times. She was a contestant on Jeopardy in 1974. Well, Evie, yes, that sums up a little bit of you, but uh, having known you for those 30 years and seen what a wonderful uh, trained eye you have with all that historical background, um, I, 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 must, I must confess many times I've looked through a pile of cards after, uh, you, uh, I've looked through a pile of cards and then you've looked after me and you've pulled cards out and I go, ooh, that was an interesting card. Why didn't I look closer at that? Uh, that's your trained eye, Evie, and it's, um, it's pretty wonderful. So today uh, you're going to be talking about uh, traditional pigtails, cut or not cut. Um, I'm excited to see this. Again, I, as I said before, uh, we have a slight crossover with my tea collection. Uh, I know washing machines and, and, and laundry is, is more the focus, but... Uh, uh, I'm very jealous of many of your cards, Evie. Anyway, you have the floor. Okay. Lord help us here. Okay, slideshow. Okay, people have asked me why and how I ever started my collection. Well, this trade card and another one mentioned Dennis, somebody named Dennis, and the Chinese question. Well, I had absolutely no idea what that meant. And so I started doing some research. And then I started collecting cards that had and images that had to do with how the Western uh, world perceived Chinese people. And it led me to this huge collection with all sorts of interesting observations, which I hope I can share with you. So the Chinese must go movement began in San Francisco, but the emphasis on the not like us part had become part of the national consciousness in order to get the national Chinese exclusion law passed. So starting in California, the Chinese, had come, Chinese people had come here to, or Chinese men, to work on the gold fields in the uh, gold rush in the 1850s and on the railroad in the 1860s. And when that work was done, they migrated mostly to the West Coast and mostly to San Francisco. So San Francisco had passed many, many laws aimed at Chinese immigrants. And one of them was called the uh, pigtail or Q or ordinance. Q is just another word for pigtail. So I will use them interchangeably. Um, the laws were passed, including one called the Sanitary Act. And since the only 
Chinese people who were here were the men. Uh, they tended to room together in small spaces, so they passed an act called the Sanitary Act, which meant that there had to be 500 cubic feet of space minimum for each person. And if you violated that act, you went to jail. So a lot of people violated that act because they figured, all right, I'll go to jail, I'll get some good food, and I'll have more space. And so the jails became filled with Chinese violators of the Sanitary Act. So at that point, the Chinese and the San Francisco City Council passed the pigtail ordinance, which, which aimed to discourage Chinese men from violating the Sanitary Act and, and going to jail. Uh, the law stated that the pigtail would be cut off and their heads would be shaved to within one inch of their scalp. And the problem was that many of them had come here, most of them had come here with the goal of making a living and getting money and going back. And if they went back, the uh, uh, Qing Dynasty would... Um, which had mandated the pigtail there and had a pretty serious punishments, including death penalty for people who did not um, obey, did not want to have pigtails. Um, so they had to have their had to keep their pigtails because when they went back to China, they would be punished. So many, many Chinese men lost their pigtails as a result of that. And as one man in 1879, a man named Cao, uh, decided this isn't right after they cut his pigtail off. And so he sued the city of San Francisco. And lo and behold, a federal judge, despite a lot of protests in San Francisco, gave him the victory. It was a violation of the 14th Amendment and was settled with $10,000, which was a lot of money in 18. 79. This card that I'm showing now shows many of the stereotypes that the Chinese were used, uh, were portrayed with to emphasize that they were different from us, that they were not like us, including the rat, which they claimed was part of the Chinese diet, the opium pipe, the childlike behavior with the two floating down on their pigtails and the pigtail, of course, right there. This is the actual document that was printed in San Francisco in 1879, repealing the Q ordinance or pigtail ordinance. And here is an example of the ridiculing. These are two stereotypically drawn Irish kids, and they are going after the Chinese man who's selling cigars. And uh, one of them has tied the pigtail to a bar, and the other running off with cigars. This was part of the of the tendency to ridicule the Chinese men, make them feel that they were less than us and gave justification for racism. This is a ticket, invitation, invitation ticket to a Mardi Gras uh, ball in, by the fourth, by the crew, they did like the Rex and other band organizations called crews. This was the Funny 40 Fellows and in March 1881, they had their bowl, ball. And if you look at the bottom left right here where my cursor is, you can see a Chinese man being pulled out of this rolled up document by his pigtail. A jester is, is uh, doing this. Now, one of the things that I also learned and through, actually on Facebook, there's a group called Mississippi Delta Chinese a lot of Chinese uh, went to work in the Mississippi Delta after the Emancipation Proclamation and the great migration north of the, uh, of the freed slaves. And 
this um, there is still a very strong presence in the Mississippi Delta, and there's a museum of Mississippi Delta Chinese. Most of them ran grocery stores, uh, and many of those grocery stores, the children and grandchildren of those people are still in the Delta. So this is an example of a military, a white military soldier. This is a French guard controlling the Chinese person by pulling his pigtail. This is one of the crown jewels of my collection. I actually have this cap gun. This is a, from a page from an 1882 catalog issued by the Unexcelled Fireworks Company. And it shows a Chinese man, you would put the cap in his mouth. You would pull his pigtail, as you could see. When the pigtail was pulled, the white man's boot went up, kicking the Chinaman in the butt. And the slogan on the gun, the Chinese must go. You can buy a dozen of these for $2 in 1882. I paid a lot more for mine. Another example of a military man trolling Chinaman by pulling his, and I will tend to use the word Chinaman, though I know it is offensive to some, but it is part of the vernacular of the day. Again, military holding two men pulling their pigtails. And here is a very proud sailor who has a handful of cues that he has cut off. And if you look over here to the left, you can see one about to remove the cue of another Chinese man. This is an American card for a jeweler. Watch us pull his tail, a Yankee Yank. Now that he was in New York, Pennsylvania, I would assume there was not a major Chinese population there, but yet, they felt it was okay to do this. And again, I am not getting along as good as I could as I could. The Chinese man has very, very rid ridiculously portrayed, and he's being pulled by the pigtail. This is a theater um ad for something called Byron's Combination, which I couldn't find anything out. I kept getting Lord Byron, and I don't know this had nothing to do with him. But if you look right down here, there is a, an Irishman pulling the pigtail of the Chinese man. And there's all sorts of people from all over the world indicating the international appeal of Byron's Combination. And this set of four cards shows uh, the two kids again going to the Chinese man who's minding his business. And if you notice some of the signs, uh, they high of the converted he converting the heathen heathens, hoodlamism, pulling the pigtail, and he goes over the box, which is kind of a symbol of him being kicked out the Chinese problem solved. So this shows uh, one, one Chinese child pulling another one's pigtail and it's, uh, would you ride in my voiture or, or vehicle? Um, in, 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 in thinking about the fact that there are many in, incident, uh, excuse me, examples of Chinese on Chinese, ridiculing the pigtail. One must remember that all of these images were created by white people. So even though it looks like the Chinese person is ridiculing the pigtail, it's really white person who created this image. And all of these others, again, the pigtail being pulled as a prank. This is an ad for a French restaurant in, um, in Paris, a Chinese restaurant. And here is a tea card. Uh, the man from the Union Pacific Tea Company is holding up his cup. The other one who was obviously had a different brand of tea has been vanquished 
by having his pigtail pulled. Once again, created by white people. And to show that even animals didn't like Chinese people. Here we have examples of a couple of animals pulling the pigtail. And in this case, it's a dog. In this case, you see the pigtail as a border around his face. This is a mechanical card. When you open the card, the monkey pulls the pigtail. And here's another example with a dog. And here's an example of two kids, Chinese kids having their pigtails tied together by the white child who's using it as a swing. And here's an American or white woman, I guess, with a pigtail and a Chinese man with a pigtail. Their pigtails have been tied together and the young perpetrator is jumping over the pigtail. This is another mechanical card. You can look at this image and you can see that the two men that are sitting here are in great pain. They both have a look on their faces that they're hurting. Well, there is a tab on the right hand side. Can I close this thing? I guess not. Okay. When you pulled the tab, the uh, it was revealed it's revealed that the two Chinese men have had their pigtails tied together as a prank, and the other and, and a child is sitting and swinging on them. This is a label for Christmas crackers, which are um, being English that uh, you pull the tab on the cracker and it kind of exploded. It wasn't a fire or kind of firecracker, just a cracker. And once again, the firecracker is as the two braids and the two Chinamen China, look very, very pained. And the perpetrator is kind of sitting on the floor grinning. So how else did they ridicule the pigtail? Well, they showed it being used for other things. In this case, it's a clothesline in a Chinese laundry. So this shows the um, stereotypical Chinese laundry. I have a whole album and then some of, of Chinese laundry images. And uh, here, three Chinese men's pigtails are being used to pull a boat with three women on it. This is a Christmas card from De La Rue, which was an English company. This trade card and the next one, the um, pigtail is being used by the totally unaware Chinese man. It's being dipped in paint to be used as a paintbrush right here. And here as well. And if you notice, there's a uncolored side of this card. This was an, exa an example, and there are many, of course. There are games, there are card games, there are the cap gun, there are skittles or, or bowling pins aimed at children. So the children would also grow up believing that the Chinese people were worth ridiculing because they were not like us. They're different. This image is from a children's book. And Poor Old Chinaman is one of the poems, one of the pages. So it's the Chinese laundry picture. And if you'll notice here, the pigtail is being used to hold a light bulb. Right here. Here is a, a pair of postcards that show Chinese man, again, fishing. He has his... Uh, pigtail in the water used as the fishing line and he's breeding and all of a sudden he gets the bite he leans forward and up comes the fish and he's been successful so once again kind of a ridiculous image if you think about it
This is called the benefits of the Chinese coiffure. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. And it showed the Chinese pigtail being used also as a fishing pole and as a, a fishing line and to rescue someone from drowning. They also used the pigtail to actually write words to once again ridicule it. So this is an American card for Fairbanks soap, and the word Fairbanks is written in with the pigtail. This is a postcard, the way I feel. The expression is, is grotesque, and the entire phrase is written with his pigtail. And words are poor means to express my feelings. Once again, kind of a grotesque image. He's holding the money, he's got the Chinese laundry, and the pigtail is used to express the message. It's a piece of sheet music, Chung Lo, a Chinese monkey doodle by Neil Moret, and that is obviously not a Chinese name, wrote that. And the brain is used for, to actually do the name of the piece of music, which I assume he is Chung Lo. So for more ridiculousness, we have the pigtail being used as uh, for pratfalls. It gets caught on something and the, uh, the owner of the pigtail either falls or in some way is harmed. So this is by a, an artist named Graham Hyde who did a lot of illustrations with Chinese um, men on them. This is a, a postcard. Here is the pigtail being caught in a door and the person is, is dropping the plates. Now this is a this is actually a man. One one of the other differentiations was not only to make them Chinese men childlike, but also to feminize them. They did laundry. There's a, they're in ads ads with women who are looking at soap, and they're the only man in the ad. This is another thing aimed at children. It's a stencil, and they could stencil the design. Again, the pigtail caught on a tree. This is a card that uh, apparently, once again, kind of a grotesque expression, was used, it's dated 1902, and it was used, uh, had li licorice attached to it, and it said, flexible licorice, can you braid my pigtail? So I guess they would use licorice to make a pigtail. And here's a gentleman in a Chinese laundry there are all kinds of tales about this place. I saw one a couple of yards long in Chinatown. So this is a very long one. The normal pigtail was waist length. This is far longer than that. This is pretty obvious. This is an alternate spelling of Q. You will also see it's spelled C-U-E as well as Q-U-E-U-E. -U -E. Hence, we use the word pigtail which is only spelled one way. This was something called a pigtail parade where children, men, if you'll notice the one in the front of the line has an opium pipe in his hand and he's blowing smoke, um, where they would walk in a line holding each other's pigtail. And here's a plate with a pigtail parade on it. Here we go, all in a row, holding on to pigtails. Ho, ho, ho. Once again, those are all boys. And sometimes the pigtails were false, were, were hair pieces. So in this case, the child, white child, attaches a helium balloon to the end of the pigtail. The balloon goes up in the air, and so does the man's hat and pigtail. This is an interesting set. It's a French set where the white gentleman comes 
to the Chinese man and says, that is a beautiful pigtail. I, I, I think I want it. So let's trade. So they wind up trading. The Chinese man walks off with the umbrella and the white man's jacket. He's keeping the rest of his outfit, his shoes and everything. And the white man now has the Chinese man's pigtail attached to his kind of reddish hair. And must be very happy that he has a pigtail. This is uh, Henry Ward Beecher, who was a abolitionist preacher in Brooklyn, New York. And he sided with the Chinese people and against the Exclusion Act. This was published in 1882, the year that the Exclusion Act was passed. And I don't believe I mentioned it, but the Exclusion Act was passed in 1882. There were uh, revisions of it. It was not repealed until 1943 in something called the Magnuson Act, which... Um, was only done because the Chinese and the United States had become allies in World War II. So this is Henry Ward Beecher, sympathetic to the Chinese people. So he is dressed in Chinese clothes and he has the pigtail. And there's the Irishman behind him with a shillelagh. And this is one of the two examples. I have others that I'm going to show you of the, the ringer, which was a, uh, a device used in laundries to get the water out. Uh, and it is being used, caught, the pigtail is caught in the ringer. And obviously we know what's gonna happen to him if he, if he goes through the ringer. And then this is the original one that I showed you at the beginning. This is what they call a metamorphic trade card, or it's before and after. This is Dennis Kearney, and he's telling um, Ah Sin, who's a, it's once again a stereotypical name for a Chinese man, um, to go ahead, put your pigtail in. And there it is. He's putting his pigtail in. The question solved. Chinese must go. That was the actual motto of the working man's party that Dennis Kearney led in San Francisco previous to the passing of the Exclusion Act. And this is the Chinaman's party. It is um, a wonderful game akin to pin the tail on the donkey that I got from dealer uh, Bob Staples and Barbara Charles. It's printed on linen and it's three feet high, and you were supposed to cut off the pigtails and just as you would blind, be blindfolded and spun around three times and try to put the pigtail back on the Chinaman. But what I loved about this was on the rules, it said, restore his cue. And it's well known that a Chinaman without his cue is debarred from entering the celestial paradise. Celestial was another word used for the Chinese um, empire. The Chinese empire was the cel celestial empire. And is subject to scorn and contumely by his countrymen. An opportunity is given by this game to repair such loss and restore the sufferer to his proper condition. So that's kind of taking a sympathetic turn. Look at the... Chinese man's plight. Well, that is the last slide, but here's what I would like to say to um, sum things up. All right. Even though the pigtail itself is no longer an issue, another group, African Americans, is facing unjust treatment or consequences based on hairstyles. 20 states have passed so-called crown acts, banning texturism, 
discrimination against natural hair by schools and businesses, um, firing policies, et cetera. In 2022, the House of Representatives, our House of Representatives, it doesn't seem to be able to do much, passed a Crown Act, and it is now awaiting passage by the Senate. Crown is an acronym for Create Respectful and Open World for Natural Hair. So the concept of not like us is still used to justify racist discrimination and violence. The so-called populist movement of today, bringing this whole thing around to today, demonizes those who do not look like, talk like, dress like, or worship like the dominant culture. They do not see these differences as enriching their culture. They perceive those differences as a dilution of their culture. So that is the conclusion, and uh, thank you for listening. And uh, any questions on here? Dave. Well, Evie, thank you so much. Um, let me get my video, um, which apparently I can't. Join the world of technophobes. Yes, well, in any event, you can hear me. Can I can you... hear you just fine, and I'm looking at a baseball stadium. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> you know, we, we could have very easily called yours and Sarah's presentations um, uh, under the general rubric of history repeats itself. Um, so, you know, you clearly in Sarah's talk, here I am, and, and in yours, we do see history repeating itself um, in, and in some ways um, in, in very unfortunate ways. Um, one of the first questions kind of uh, ties in with your remark on um, uh, on Henry Ward Beecher. And the question is, during the time that these cards were published and distributed, was there any discussion of the negative portrayal in them um, that they make of people, for, uh, of men from China? Discussion at the... Well, at any level. I mean, did, did people point out well, there were there were there were people that opposed the um, exclusion act, mostly in the in the same in the states that we now consider blue states on the east coast. Yeah, and uh, there there was a very but it was very the, the religious organizations, the abolitionists, the they were against um, ex, they were for exclusion. Um, for maintaining the dominant culture and the negative images um, to get a law passed by the national legislature involved all of the states. Well, not all of the states had Chinese people living in them. So these negative images, the stereotypes, um, the American ones I'm talking about, um, were a way to turn people against the Chinese who had never seen them, who, who never, who had no idea. All they know is, knew is that these people ate rats, they smoked opium, they were heathens. So the media did their job and it started, as I said, with games and stuff for children that, uh, yeah. that created that. Well, it's a, it's a pervasive reinforcement of that negative <laughs> attitude. I wondered too, um, did the Exclusion Act have, this is a, a question from another participant, did the Exclusion Act have its roots in San Francisco or in the Bay Area or Northern California? It had its roots in, in San Francisco, the Working Man's Party, Dennis Kearney, and California had its own Exclusion Act first before, um, before the National Act. Yeah, okay. Um, and another... Um, observation that was made is that um, even though, and, and this goes back to your slide that um, showed the uh, uh, advertisement from New York, Pennsylvania, and you made the comment that even though there probably wasn't a large Chinese population in New York, Pennsylvania, they're appropriating this image of the China, Chinese man and his, his cue. Um, and the comment was that, you know, this is the uh, you know, manufacturers are taking things from popular culture and appropriating that in their advertising in an attempt to draw attention to 
their products or their services. Um, and sure. you see that uh, here, you see that in a very negative way. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm surprised when I go, when I'm driving around and I see businesses with signs for um, a particular candidate, usually businesses would sort of stay neutral. But I guess in the case of Chinese exclusion, it was kind of, well, it's okay. We can ridicule them. They're different. Yeah. And I think, I mean, we all know from history that um, they weren't the only ones, but um, right. they, they were pretty easy targets for, for uh, many people. Another question is, was there any backlash against the companies who marketed these images? That is to say, and, and that builds on the comment you just made. Um, was there any backlash at the time against these images? I have never seen anything. I mean, it wasn't like now where if 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 a, a CEO announces that I've donated X million dollars to this political party, then those of us who believe in the other political party can say, all right, I'm not going to eat there yep. or buy their stuff or whatever. I mean, now we know business, corporate businesses what side they're on, who they donate to, and we right. can make decisions on that. Yeah. I don't think they knew then, you know, that. that... Yeah. yeah. And uh, the fact that what was disturbing for me was the way in which these images um, were per portrayed and reinforced for children. Um, you know, um, here's another question. Uh, when the Exclusion Act was passed, was it that um, just new Chinese immigration was stopped um, or were the ones who were already here not forced to go? Is that a safe assumption? In other words, um, the ones who were here were not forced to go, but it was new Chinese immigration that this was targeted? Right, they were targeting um, laborers because they, the thing they're, they're taking, they're stealing our jobs. So that right. was that was the mentality. I, they always allowed um, students, like college students, were always allowed to come. There were there were several who graduated from Yale, I think, in the in in the eighteen sixties or so, and um, they they did. Um, let's see, how do I want to say? How do I want to phrase it? Well, in you know in. If you flash ahead to 2021, their women couldn't come, right? So they couldn't have um, their families were back in China. So if they made the decision to go back to China to see their wives and bring the money, whatever, many times they couldn't get back in the country, and they often used uh, were forced to use fake immigration papers. There's a whole thing called paper sons about about them who, who were afraid to speak up because they would be deported. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as I started to say, I mean, you flash ahead to 20, uh, 2024, um, 2023, and worldwide, we're dealing with these same issues um, and the demonizing and, and the rhetoric and uh, the advertising, you know, um, Today we live, as as we all know, in an in an electronic world, and we send, tend to see these negative images electronically. Um, then, of course, um, they were printed because that was the the printed, you know, that was the technology for distributing. Um, here's another question, and and this is a question. Um, it's kind of interesting, uh, and I think it ties in with um, the timeliness of um, discrimination. Uh, and the whole issue of, of immigration. But the question is, has it become harder for you in the last few years to find items to add to your collection? Well, advanced collectors like John Kemmler are always teasing me with things that they have that I don't have. Um, I, I think I have probably 80, 85% of the trade cards that, that I know of. Uh, Tamar has quite a few that she won't give me. And um, <laughs> same, same with John Kemmler. Um, and so I know that there are things that exist that I don't have. 
but I'm very lucky to go to, a, if I go to a show and I find something that is affordable, because the other thing is the institutions are now waking up to the fact that, hey, we don't have this stuff. We, our collections are basically white European men, and we now have to have to start acquiring women and uh, LGBTQ and African American and other collections to show the, the breadth of contribution to American culture. So PBS has been doing some fabulous documentaries on this, yes. which I urge anyone to watch and um, on all of the things that we weren't taught in school, not just Chinese well, exclusion. Well, you know, uh, uh, apart from uh, Collector Envy with Tamar and others, um, it would seem <laughs> as though, it would seem as though um, it, it has become more difficult in, in my field, uh, African-American baseball, uh, it's becoming even more difficult because uh, in in a similar fashion, um, institutions are now becoming aware of this and right. want, to want to expand the knowledge base. Um, uh, here's a here's a, an interesting question. The Byron Combination was a touring group of theatrical theatrical comedians, um, circa 1885, led by Oliver Byron. One of their advertised funniest plays was called Across the Continent. Um, I think that's just an observation, uh, not a not a uh, not a question for you. But thank you for the, the. I guess this was a theater person, so thank you. Well, it's it's from uh, somebody who's uh, deeply involved in uh, institutional um, institutional ephemera. Um, well, this has been uh, a very very interesting. And uh, for me, uh, informative presentation. Um, I did not know that the Chinese Q uh, had become the target of such attention. And uh, I, uh, it's, it's, it's been very informative for me. And I, I hope the same has been uh, true of the, of the rest of our audience. And I'll, I'll, end, I'll end this one, um, your presentation, Evie, uh, the same way I did with Sarah, and that is, this person writes to say, my God, I've learned so much today from your talk. So thank you, Evie Eisenberg. And now, David. That, that must have been my son, maybe. Well, it, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not allowed to reveal names. Evie. That's okay. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Back you to you. Always for your for your insight. <laughs> Evie, thank yes, you. That, that was great. Only one I'm tea drinking, card to you. Only, I'm, dr I'm only. drinking tea, David. Good, good. Pleased to hear it. Uh, Sarah, thank you. That was fantastic. Really enjoyed today. Mike, thanks for your uh, always beautifully curated questions. Uh, I, I know we put the raw product in there, but you do it so beautifully. Um, I also want to thank Barbara Lowe, who uh, uh, I think got very close to you, Evie, if that <laughs> If, that, if I hear correctly, Evie Barbara had fun with her. Beth, yeah, Barbara and, yeah. and Mary and Beth. And of course, well. Mary Beth, who's kept us on track the entire time. Thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, don't forget uh, two things. One, at 4.30, we have Marvin's virtual show, which I encourage all members to go to. Uh, Non-members, Saturday at midday. And then again, the 14th to the 17th of March in Greenwich. We'd love to see you guys there. Um, thank you for today and farewell till March. Bye.